What does this look like to you? Well, there was a movie many years ago, I'm starting to learn that it was actually probably from before you were born, that imagined a world in which we lived in a computer simulation, and this was the data that made up the world. And we interpreted the world as touch and taste as we interpreted this data. Your Fourier transform infrared spectrometer does the same thing. It creates a set of raw data, but that is not the spectrum that is printed on the page. The spectrum that is printed on the page is an interpretation of that raw data, the Fourier transform of that data. So this spectroscopy lecture is on the subject of IR spectroscopy, and we're going to be talking about the Fourier transform in Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. And this is a really important piece of mathematics. It was invented or credited to Joseph Fourier, who was a very important French mathematician. And he invented this idea of being able to extract a signal um, from a, a set of data and determine which exact frequencies were in there. And uh, the, the method today is called the Fourier transform. Um, despite how important Joseph Fourier was, the French, as far as I can find, have never honored him with a stamp. So uh, get busy, France. Uh, Joseph Fourier needs a stamp. I just made a fake stamp there. So let's imagine this frequency right here. I just created this frequency with a math package. I just just, just calculated it. That's uh, imagining a frequency of uh, uh, 5 per period. So imagine your frequency was 5 per centimeter. I know IR is... Uh, between 500 and 5,000 per centimeter, but uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I just used simple numbers in my calculations. So imagine I've got this wave number of 5 per unit distance, uh, and I just made it with this little simple formula here. Um, do you think you could tell that this is 5 per centimeter? I bet you could. You just take out a ruler and you measure and you go, hey, it went up and down 5 times in a centimeter. And that's pretty simple, um, And but we can do this with math. We don't have to just measure it. Uh, we can do this with a simple mathematical algorithm, the Fourier transform. So what is the Fourier transform? In its simplest form, and Fourier's math is much more sophisticated than this, but in its simplest form, all you have to do is multiply an unknown signal by a test frequency. If you multiply a signal of 5 centimeters or 5 per centimeter by the exact same signal, 5 per centimeter, let's do this. Look at this. 5 per centimeter times 5 per centimeter, you get the square of that. Now, the square of anything that goes up and down across zero, all the negative lobes turn into positive lobes, you get nothing but positive. If I integrate this across infinity, I'm going to get an infinite value. If I integrate it across a span of one, I'll get an area of one. So if that signal exists and you multiply your, your sample by a test frequency that is in that sig uh, signal, you're going to get a value. So all you could think of the Fourier transform is, is let's just test our frequency, keep multiplying in test frequencies and see if they're there. Um, that's not how your computer does it. Uh, your computer uses an algorithm called the fast Fourier transform, which is much better than the one I'm going to discuss. But I think we can understand it as this idea of testing to see if it's in there. So here I have tested to see if the signal of 5 per centimeter is in there. And guess what? It is. You can see that that's going to integrate to a positive value. Uh, so uh, if there's a positive value, that means it exists. Now, what about other signals? Well, let's try multiplying by 3 per centimeter. If we multiply by 3 per centimeter, so you can see the result alternates above and below, just like the original signal did. If you integrate this across infinity, it will total up to 0, because it's just as much time below the line as above the line. So instead of getting a value of 1, which we did when we tested for 5 per centimeter, we're going to get a value of 0. Now there it is right there. Um, so when I tested for 3 per centimeter, I got 0. When I tested for 5 per centimeter, I got a value. Here I'm multiplying by 6 per centimeter. And again, you will see the integration spends as much time below the line as above. We're going to total up to 0. So when we do the result, we will have 0 again. So when I test for a frequency that's not there, it should integrate to 0 across infinity. If I test for a frequency that is there, you should get a value proportional to the strength of the signal in your sample. So let's examine every frequency here from 1 through 10. Let's do that. What am I going to get? Every test frequency that's not there gives me a value of 0. 
Every test frequency that's not there is still zero. The one that is there gave me a signal. So this interferogram right here, which might be for a laser beam with an imaginary frequency of five per centimeter, um, this single signal right here had one single frequency in it and we spotted it. If we could graph it with a bar graph, which is probably the most appropriate way to graph it because we just tested at discrete values. Uh, but we could also connect the lines. Um, but that implies that at four and a half, we've got halfway up. And is that true? Is that what the line really looks like? Still, it's a good way to follow the graph. And you can see that I've got this peak. I have a peak, just like you might have in your NMR um, or IR. A signal, if it exists, will show up with a value. If it doesn't exist, it's not there. Now, what if I don't have such a straightforward cut and dried frequency? Do you know what frequencies are in this interferogram right here? Can you just look at that and tell me that there are frequencies in there? I, I think there's two separate frequencies in this particular signal. Measure it up, tell me what they are. Kind of difficult, but let's just multiply by one per centimeter, two per centimeter, three per centimeter. Let's just do all the tests and see what happens as we go through. The program I'm using is this program here that I wrote for Maple. Um, it's a really inefficient, horrible program, but it works. I'm not putting myself forward as a computer scientist. This is what I managed to put together. Um, but basically what we're doing is we are creating a signal. Uh, there's the sample signal. We are creating a test signal. We are, uh, whether it's one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeter, I just going through this loop here, try one all the way up to 10 in increments of one. There's the increment one there. Um, so I've set up these variables. I can change them as I wish. Um, and I'm going to test 10 possible signals with this algorithm. So you can go through that yourself. You can write it, program it into Maple or Mathematica or another math package and see if um, you can test your known signal with an integration, something like that. And when I do this, when I go through this sample here, let's see what the results were. I can't tell what's going on here with my eyes, but with math, I'm going to apply the algorithm and I'm going to get zero for one, zero for two, etc. Look, I got something for five. Six and seven were zero, I got something for eight. So this signal contains the frequencies of five per centimeter and eight per centimeter in my math. And the Fourier transform found them both. And basically it gave me a list of the frequencies I tested for and values if they were present. And of course we could show this in a more traditional connect the dots graph. Um, so there's basically how we could get a spectrum, which your eyes can quickly recognize. This is kind of useless information to you. This is the kind of thing where you go, oh, that frequency, that frequency, oh, a carbonyl, oh, uh, a cyano group. Um, that's the kind of thing that your eyes can quickly spot. You, you can see the trees. If you're just listening to the rustling of the trees, it's difficult to picture the forest. But when we show you the forest, you can see the trees. Well, here's the rustling. I can't quite put that together, but a computer could interpret that and tell you exactly where the trees are. So here's a computer interpretation of this signal. Now, now that we've got those signals, uh, um, let's examine uh, some more sort of complicated cases. So here we go. So let's examine what happens with a more real world case with our data. Our data is not always going to uh, last forever. I was talking about integrating over infinity. Well, we all know we can't integrate over infinity. Our data starts somewhere and ends somewhere. And this is important for the signal um, and the shape of the uh, result. So what I'm gonna do now is rather than integrating over exact discrete increments of um, some uh, integer fraction of the uh, uh, of the period, I'm going to go in increments of 0.1. And what happens if I go in increments of 0.1 is, of course, I'm not going to be evenly matching up with the beginning and end of my frequency sample. I'm going to be 0.1 off, 0.2 off, 0.3 off. So the integration is going, well, it's not going to add up to perfectly zero if the signal's not there, and it's not going to add up to perfectly one if the signal is there. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be sampling in between. And the reason for that is that um, I end with these sharp drops. And when I apply the increment at 0.1 and I obtain the plot, look what I get. That looks a little strange. And this wavy pattern, this ringing pattern, if you will, is the result of the truncation of this data. This wavy form here is actually the Fourier transform of a square wave. 
This is like my data encapsulated within a square wave, don't you think? This truncated signal, because I've chopped it right off here, it's as if I have a signal that is multiplied by zero, then multiplied by, say, one or 100%, and then multiplied by zero again. It's as if I have applied some kind of square timing filter to my signal. So you can imagine if I was listening to, oh, I don't know, the hum of the universe through my radio telescope, I switched on the radio telescope here, I switched it off there, and then I applied the Fourier transform, I would get this wavy pattern. So if your data ends suddenly in a flat wall, you're going to get this, uh, well, basically the echo of that, or the, the shape of your data is gonna show up in the shape of your lines. Each line centers on its frequency, and then its line shape is the shape of the data, the Fourier transform of the shape of the data. So how can I minimize this? I, I would like to get some nice peaks that represent the frequencies, I don't want to see the shape of my data in there. Well, we have to use a data shape that has a different line shape, uh, preferably something that uh, doesn't have this ringing pattern. One way to do that is to take the signal down to zero at the end. Um, and this will solve the problem of your uh, fractional um, sampling because obviously, uh, you know, if we're off the end here, it's kind of all zero. Off the end here, it's all zero. So it should minimize this ringing. So let's take this data, and rather than having it switch on and switch off, what I'll do is I'll just multiply this block by this triangle. This is called an apodization function. It's, uh, uh, you're multiplying the data, this is the original data, started here, ended here. I've multiplied it by this function, which is a triangular function, there's the function that I multiplied it with, and I've created something that tapers down to zero at both ends. And then, when I apply the Fourier transform and apply that algorithm in my clumsy, um, computer program, look what I get now. I get a system, I mean, we still see some imperfections, but it's much better than it was before. And there are different apodization functions, exponential ones, power ones, um, all kinds of different treatments you can give your raw data to improve your line shape. Always keep this in mind, that the spectrum that was generated by your computer has been manipulated by that computer, um, you know, should it have looked like this? Should it have looked like this? Should it be perfectly flat and then come up with nice sharp peaks? I can change the peak width. I can change the peak shape by changing these apodization functions. So always keep that in mind. It's not really a big deal for Fourier transform infrared spectrometry, but in NMR, this will be much more of, a, of something to think about, the idea of how you manipulate your data mathematically before you apply the Fourier transform. So we've got this triangular apodization function. Another thing we could do to improve the shape of our data is to have more of it. I mean, when you don't have very much data, you don't have very much information. If you don't have very much information, there's a certain amount of uncertainty, if you will, and that kind of shows up in the result of uh, your experiment. The more data you have um, in Fourier transform, the narrower your line widths are gonna be. That's just a mathematical fact. The more data you have, the more um, uh, you have to integrate over. Um, if you're near the frequencies, the more likely you are to integrate for a lower value if you have more data. Um, that way, uh, you should have nice finer line widths if you've got more data, more integration. So I've taken the same signal. I've, I've taken it over a longer time period. I've multiplied it by the same apodization function to take it down to zero at the ends. But notice this is over three periods of data, whereas this was only over one period. So if I've got three times the data, what does that do to my Fourier transform, look at those nice sharp peaks. And even that ringing has reduced because I've got more data, that means more integration um, and uh, basically better results. So the more data you have, the longer you can uh, run the mirror out on your Fourier transform infrared spectrometer, the greater distances your mirrors run, the finer your peaks are gonna be and the higher resolution your instrument. Does your instrument mirrors run over one centimeter, over two centimeters, over four centimeters? Four centimeters will give you uh, 0.25 uh, per centimeter resolution, which means basically um, you would get four samples per wave number in your spectrum. And that would, that would pretty much give you a, you know, even a very narrow peak would be spotted if you had a four centimeter uh, movement of your mirrors. So uh, the more information you have, the longer your NMR experiment, the more uh, distance your interferogram is run on your FTIR, the better your peaks are going to be. Um, so let's have a nostalgic picture before we had more data. Look at those big broad line widths. When we had more data, the same Fourier transform gives us much narrower line widths, and that's what more data can do. Now, 
One last point, more data, right? Well, when you're taking your data, you need to make sure that there are more data points uh, in your spectrum than there are lines in your spectra. Or really what it comes down to is you need more than one data point per peak. Let's look at a interferogram here. Here's an interferogram with lots of data points. And now I'm going to show you the actual, I'm gonna, uh, well, sorry, here's a second interferogram with less data points. And here's the last interferogram with a lot less data points. So really what what's, comes down to is the quality of the instrument or the amount of memory you have available in your computer. Not so much a problem now, but in my day when I was a graduate student, memory mattered and you had to think carefully about how you designed your experiment. Um, these days it's not so much an issue, but what if your experiment, your instrument can only capture data so fast? Um, I imagine it's more of a problem on low power systems like spacecraft, but if you have not enough data, it can cause problems. So let's look at this data set. I'm just gonna connect them with straight lines. And I don't know, that looks like a waveform. Let's take the original waveform this data set represents. There it is, coming in in red. And overlay it, and it looks almost perfect. So if you've got lots of data, you've got all the information you need. Now let's take this data, it looks like a, a good cloud. Let's connect them all by straight lines. That's the waveform that I would be applying the Fourier transform to. Let's take my original data and hold it over and see what happens here. Pretty good, look at that, look at that. But there's a few places where we don't capture all the information. You know, we're missing information in a few spots. This data would still give us a fairly decent spectrum because the frequencies are still there, but every so often we miss a piece, right? And so we're going to have some artifacts. Um, so that would be uh, not the best. And of course, this is a disaster. I mean, can you see the frequencies in this? I can't, I mean, I think we've missed some. Um, and sure enough, when you put the original data over there, you can see that we just, it doesn't represent it at all. So if your resolution of your instrument is too low, you will not be able to see the peaks. Basically Fourier transform won't even know they're there because we didn't capture them. Um, and uh, so you have to make sure that your instrument takes enough data points over the mirror movement um, to capture all the peaks. If you're taking too few, you will not have a quality Fourier transform. So for the Fourier transform, things that are gonna affect your data quality is of course the apodization function you apply as you try to make sure that your data is not truncated and your data will always be truncated. That mirror has to stop somewhere. So you'll be applying an apodization function to take it down to zero. What's the shape of that function? That's gonna affect the line shape. Um, how long did that mirror move? How much data do you have? How long did you run your NMR experiment? How much data do you have is going to affect the line width. And of course, the resolution is going to be affected by how many data points you have. Your Fourier transform is only as good as how many data points you have. And if you've got frequencies that are higher than the frequency of your data sampling, they're not gonna show up or they're gonna show you weird artifacts, of course, because they, they will uh, get caught by the data every now and then. Uh, but uh, it, it's kind of like take two combs and line them up to each other. Take two window screens and line them up. You'll get these kind of moire patterns if, uh, the fre if your frequency doesn't, is not way higher than uh, the frequency of sampling is not way higher uh, than it needs to be. Um, so to avoid these sort of weird effects in the math, make sure that you've got lots of data points. All right, so that's sort of the things to think about as you're building your, uh, or as you're interpreting your data set. It is a computer interpretation. Um, it is not the actual raw data. Um, so you always have to keep that in mind. Now, uh, in the previous presentation, I presented uh, something that looked a bit more like an IR spectrum, like it was a whole bunch of data points, and I did a Fourier transform of like 3,000 data points with some data missing. I'm gonna show you how I did that as we interpret the Fourier transform. So this data set right here is uh, created by adding 30 different frequencies together, between one and 30. So I just, I just did 30 cosine waves between one and 30 per, uh, period per centimeter in this case. And, and there's the center peak, optical path, difference of zero. And there's the wing, right? And if I did a Fourier transform of this, one would expect that, um, you know, I've set the increment to one. I could have done 0.1, but um, I, I was sort of discovering that my computer has limitations. Um, so I did one, so I only had to do this 30 times. And so I created the signal um, from one to 30, and I, there's the signal. I set the increment to one, and then I test that signal against all of these test signals. And what am I gonna get if I have all the signals here? I should see a value of one for everything, right? All 30 signals are there. 
So I've tested each of the 30 signals at the wavelengths that they are, and of course they were all there. The Fourier transform told me they were all there. What if I took one out? So this signal down here, it's all 30 less the one at 10 per centimeter. I just subtracted that one there at 10 per centimeter. And look, that's not a nice even, there's something going on here. We knew that there was data there. And if I do the Fourier transform of this, what I'm gonna see after I create this signal, and I, the only difference between this formula and this formula is that I subtracted the signal at 10 wave numbers. And then when I do the Fourier transform, I see every single frequency except the one I subtracted out. I remove that. So Fourier transform gave me a list of every frequency that was in there. There were 29 frequencies in this sample. Could you see all 29? The Fourier transform did. And of course it revealed in the list, the one that wasn't there. So that's all Fourier transform is gonna do from your computer. It's going to give you a list of the frequencies that um, come out in the math, basically. As long as your resolution's high enough, you'll have no problems. Um, what if there was a few more signals removed? So I removed a second signal. And you know, all I did to create the, uh, the sample signal in the algorithm was just to remove a second signal. And when I do the Fourier transform, you see them both missing. So that's really all I have to do to kind of simulate this idea of um, infrared spectrometry. So now I, I went crazy and I said, let's do 3000. Let's, let's sum up every frequency between one and 3000 and see if we can get a graph like this, but across 3000, something that looks a lot more like a standard IR spectrum. So here we go. That's what I did all 3000. And that's what I get. Something that looks a lot more like your FTIR interferogram. I, I imagined uh, um, adding them all up in both directions and I got this uh, system right here. Now, all I have to do is take the Fourier transform. Uh, uh, what your computer is going to do is it's going to fold that over on it uh, and take half of it um, and Fourier transform from the center out. And we will get the frequencies that are in there. So let's let's look at this in detail. Are all 3000 frequencies in there? That's the question we're asking. Do all 3000 frequencies look like they're in there? There's the signal. I'm looking at it. What do you think? Can you see the frequencies that are present and the frequencies that are missing? Fourier transform can. If I apply that algorithm to this data set that's uh, 3000 points that are added to each other with some taken out, and I didn't take them out 100%. I, I took out 60% of some, 40% of another. Um, and then I applied the algorithm and it just about choked my computer to death. Um, I thought it was gonna melt and that's okay. I want a new computer, um, but uh, it didn't melt. And there's the Fourier transform that I got showing me 100% of the frequencies here. And there's the uh, frequencies that I had subtracted out. I subtracted out 80% uh, of this frequency, 90% of that frequency, 60% of that frequency, I think, uh, oh, 25% transmit. So I subtracted 75% between 1000 and 1080 wave numbers. And here I subtracted 90% between 1750 and 1800 wave numbers. And here I subtracted from the total um, 60% of the uh, uh, 2850 to 2950. And, and then I just took that function and tested at every single frequency. Uh, and this is the result that I got. Um, it took all night for my ancient computer to, to crank all this out in Maple. Because remember, my algorithm was really ancient. It was not the fast Fourier transform algorithm. It was a continuous uh, function being applied to this huge data set 3000 times. Um, so uh, not recommended as the way to do it. Um, but doesn't th this spectrum look like your IR spectra? So here we see all the frequencies that are there and you know, like most of them are here with the exception of these that are missing. So the CH stretches, the carbonyl stretch, um, lots of business here, lots of other information here, but we can see the CO stretch really clear. These are the peaks that are missing. I found all of these frequencies and we saw reduced intensity of these frequencies. And remember, this is a computer interpretation of your FTIR. You got this signal. You subtracted the background. You, you took the um, the, F, uh, the interferogram for the background and you subtracted it from this interferogram. And you have an interferogram that represents the differences between those two signals. You did the Fourier transform on that after applying apodization and smoothing functions, and you got this. Um, so if you can trust your computer, uh, if you can trust your brain to interpret the world, then you can trust this spectrum. Um, so there's the function that I put in uh, into Maple. 
Uh, and uh, as I say, it was uh, uh, a lot of work for the computer. Um, the fast Fourier transform algorithm um, is a uh, discrete algorithm. Um, it uh, uses some tricks. It basically, in my understanding, is it must always operate in powers of two. So your data has to have 128 points, 256 points, 512 points. If you've got 490 points, you need to zero fill, like add values of zero out to 512 points. But as long as it fits into a power of two, um, and that's easy to do, just zero fill out to the next power of two and then apply the fast Fourier transform, it can do it really quick. It doesn't, it's not what I did. It's a different kind of math. And it's so quick, it can be built into chips. This math can be actually in the electronics of the chip, not even being a computer program. It's built into the hardware. And, and uh, you can actually tune in FM signals by finding the signal and then watching it move back and forth. Because remember, FM is frequently modulate, frequency modulation, right? You'd see that go back and forth and the computer can interpret that as the frequencies and turn it into sound for you. And that can be in your wristwatch. That's how powerful the fast Fourier transform algorithm is these days. It's in your cell phone to uh, find the frequencies for um, the radios on the radio towers. It's in every bit of electronic communications equipment we have. It's used to compress photographs. The Fourier transform is uh, really the center of modern technological society. And here we see it being used to interpret the spectra in IR spectrometry. Um, so if we can find the frequencies that are missing, we can give you an IR spectrum. Now, there's so much I haven't told you about this. There's a lot more to the math of the Fourier transform. For this course, which is on uh, structure elucidation, we really don't have to get too much into the details of the instrument. Um, but if you ever take a course in analytical chemistry where you look at the details of instrumentation, or um, if you uh, take a course in the electronics of instrumentation, uh, you will learn a lot more about exactly what happens inside the box. Because remember, everything that happens in life is coming out of a box. Do you believe it? Do you believe what you see on TV? Is that YouTube video real or is it faked? This is an interpretation of the raw data. Always keep that in mind. Everything you see from your NMR, from your Fourier transform, infrared spectrometer is a computer interpretation. So just have that in the back of your mind when you're wondering if maybe a peak you were expecting didn't show up. Maybe it was a really narrow peak and you didn't have enough resolution to see it. Maybe your window of frequencies you're looking at is missing it. Um, there's a lot of computational reasons sometimes why your data is not going to turn out, as well as the fact that you just did not make your sample right. I'm sorry, the, the salt cell was wet. You're always going to have garbage there. Um, so that's really the notes on Fourier transform. Remember, we start with this data. And if you look at the data of the matrix, what do you see? Are you relying on the machines to interpret it for you and give you an image? Or do you see it for the truth that it is? If you watch the matrix, which was a fun movie, do not watch the sequels. Um, they were awful. Um, but if you watch the first matrix and the only matrix, um, uh, you will understand what it means when you look at this raw data and interpret it yourself and see the truth. This is Neo, the superhero from that movie. And really his superpower was being able to look at the raw data of the world in the computer simulation he was in and see the truth and manipulate it. And that's what we do. We look at the raw data, see the truth, and manipulate it to get our final result. So Fourier transform is very important. These are some helpful uh, references uh, if you want to uh, um, uh, learn more. Um, and uh, uh, the handouts are available on the keynotechemistry.com website. Uh, and there also will be a document of this lecture basically in written form. So uh, drop by keynotechemistry.com and avail yourself of those resources. Thank you for listening.